In this video, we're going to talk about buoyancy forces. From there, we're going to develop a definition of the Grashof number and the Rayleigh, num Rayleigh number. Then we're going to talk about the form of the solutions in natural convection problems. And finally, a couple of words on the modes of convection heat transfer. So first, I'd like to think about buoyancy forces. If we imagine a particle of density rho s inside a fluid of density rho f, with gravity acting in this direction, the particle will have a weight, which of course is its density times the acceleration due to gravity times its volume, and there will be a buoyancy force of acting in the opposite direction of the weight, which is the density of the fluid times the acceleration of due to gravity times the volume. So the net force acting on this particle is going to be the weight minus the buoyancy force, is the density of the solid minus the fluid times GP. Now, of course, if the density of the solid is lighter than the density of the fluid, which is not the case drawn here, then this particle will rise in the column of fluid, and if it's heavier, it will sink in the column of fluid. We could also imagine that this was a different region of fluid, and this different region of fluid had a different density than the rest of the fluid, and therefore we would get a motion of this part of the fluid because of those buoyancy forces acting on it. That's the essence, essence of natural convection. When we have density differences in a fluid which arise because, arise because of temperature differences, then we're going to generate a fluid motion inside that fluid. Of course, the net force on this fluid particle that has a different density will be the change in density between that fluid and the rest of the fluid times the acceleration to gravity due to gravity times the volume. Now, in order to calculate what that change in density is, we need to introduce another property of a material. The volumetric coefficient of thermal expansion, beta, tells us how the density changes with temperature at a fixed pressure. And it's defined like this. So our change in density can be approximately given by the density times this volumetric coefficient of thermal expansion times the difference in temperature between these two. And if our material is an ideal gas, we have a very simple way of determining what this coefficient of vo volumetric coefficient of thermal expansion is. It's simply 1 over the temperature expressed in absolute uh, temperature or units of Kelvin. For some other material, it is a material property, and we'll have to look up what that value is. Okay, now I want to talk about the terminal velocity in Stokes flow. A Stokes flow is, is a flow uh, where we have a particle in a very viscous fluid, and the particle is subject to viscous forces. So if we put that particle in here and we have a difference in density, we know we're going to get a motion. If the, if the density of the solid is heavier than the fluid, we're going to get a motion in this direction given by the velocity u here. And as soon as we have motion, we're going to get a drag force. Well, in the case of Stokes flow, where this is opposed by the viscous forces, in a viscous fluid where the viscous forces are dominating, we can calculate that, we can solve for that drag force to be this expression here, 6 pi mu over the radius of my sphere at times this velocity. And of course, if we have an equilibrium, if the net force acting on that, the weight and the, flu the buoyancy force, is equal to this drag force, we'll get an equilibrium and the terminal velocity will be what our velocity is. So if we equate the drag force from our Stokes flow with the net force that we get, the weight minus the buoyancy force, we get the drag force, the drag force, the viscous force, is equal to this net force here. We can put in an expression of the volume for the cylinder, and we can solve for our terminal velocity. So having done that, our terminal velocity is given by this expression here. Now, I'm interested in determining the order of magnitude of this velocity. This is a velocity which has come about because of the motion of this fluid in here, in this case driven by a mass which is greater than the mass of the fluid, or a density which is greater than the density of the fluid. And this is the velocity that it achieves when it's in equilibrium with that fluid. And in fact, this phenomena can be used to measure the viscosity of a fluid. If we put a particles of known diameter and known density inside a fluid and we measure the terminal velocity, of course we can solve for what the viscosity of that fluid is. We're using it here to get a velocity scale for a motion that's induced in the flow because of a balance of these viscous forces and the net weight and buoyancy force. And that velocity scale, I'm not going to worry about these numbers here, is proportional to the change in density, the acceleration due to gravity, a length scale squared, which was r squared for our sphere, 
and divided by the viscosity. So this is the velocity scale that emerges when we have viscous forces balancing these net buoyancy force acting on the part of the fluid. Well, remember our Reynolds number. Our Reynolds number came about when we had the ratio of the inertial forces to the viscous forces. Our inertia forces was rho u infinity squared. u infinity is the forced convection velocity that we're driving over the surface. And our viscous forces is mu uh, times the change in velocity over our length scale, mu over L. And that gave us our Reynolds number here, which meant the ratio of the inertia forces to the viscous forces. And it was rho mu infinity L over mu. What I'd like to do is to convert this to account for the case where we have buoyancy forces instead of inertia forces. So in this case, we're driving the flow, we're forcing it over there, and we're determining that it's U infinity by doing that forcing. Now, if we have a part of the fluid which has a different temperature than the rest, the density will change because of that difference in temperature. And because that density will change, that will want to drive motion in there. And we just determined a velocity scale for that motion when it is in equilibrium with the viscous forces in that flow. And we saw that that velocity scale was our terminal velocity for our uh, particles in a Stokes flow, and it was given by this expression here. Well, we can substitute this into our Reynolds number for our velocity. And instead of having the forced convection velocity or the, the, the forced flow velocity of U infinity, we'll take the velocity that naturally arises because of these balances of forces. And this will lead us to talking about our natural or free convection, because the motion is not driven from anything other than the density differences, which are created by the temperature differences. So if we want to know now our ratio of the buoyancy force to the viscous force, we can take our expression for the Reynolds number over here and use this velocity scale instead of the one that we imposed in our forced convection problem. So if we substitute that in there, and we get this expression, of course, we can collect some terms there and get the length scale cubed appearing there. And now I want to introduce this change of density that we came up with previously using the, the coefficient, the volumetric coefficient of thermal expansion. So I can change this change, I can replace this change in density with a rho beta times the temperature difference between this part of my fluid and the rest of the fluid. If I do that, I get an expression like this. I have the rho squared. And now, of course, I can divide this mu squared by this rho squared, squared and get the kinematic viscosity instead of the dynamic viscosity. And this then becomes my expression, which represents the ratio of the buoyancy forces to the viscous forces. And that we give the name GR, or the Grashof number. Physically, it represents the ratio of the buoyancy forces to the viscous forces. And you can see that it takes the role pardon me, it takes the role of the Reynolds number when we're talking about natural convection flows. This will be the very important, the most important parameter in our natural convection problems, and we'll determine the flow regime just like the Reynolds number did for forced convection. And very often, in honor of Lord Rayleigh, who did, amongst many other things, lots of work in the field of natural convection, we define the Rayleigh number, which is the Grashof number times the Prandtl number. Of course, here was our Grashof number, our Prandtl number is the ratio of the kinematic viscosity to the thermal diffusivity. And so the Rayleigh number is simply having a uh, new alpha in the denominator instead of a new squared in the Grashof number. That's obviously not going to change our, the form of our correlations because we already have the Prandtl number appearing in our correlations. Let's think about that for a moment. But there's the definition of the Rayleigh number. And it will be much more common for us to use the Rayleigh number uh, than the Grashof number in the actual correlations we're going to use. So let's think about the form of solutions in convection problems. If we have a natural or free convection problem, then this Grashof number takes the place of the Reynolds number. And we would expect that our average Nusselt number will be a function of the Grashof number and the Prandtl number. Or we could replace that with the Rayleigh number, a slightly different function, which is of the Rayleigh number and the Prandtl number. And that's where we'll see a lot of our correlations. In forced convection, in comparison, we had that the Nusselt number was, of course, a function of the Reynolds number and the Prandtl number. And, of course, we could have a situation where we're passing a velocity, where we're forcing a flow over a surface, and we also have temperature gradients in it, which are, which are resulting in density gradients. And if it happens to be that those are of a similar order of magnitude, then perhaps both of those phenomena will be important, both the forced flow, governed by the Reynolds number, and the naturally arising flow coming from the density gradients. And so we may well have a situation where we have a mixed convection problem, and it'll correlate 
to a function that is of these three parameters. When is that going to occur? Well, if we do the non-dimensionalization uh, of our governing equations with these density differences in there, so adding a body force for these density-driven uh, flows, or uh, adding a body force into the Navier-Stokes equations, we actually find when we, when we non-dimensionalize it that the number that appears is actually the Grashof number to the one-half. And so the relevant scaling is actually to look at the ratio of the Grashof number to the square of the Reynolds number. Well, if the buoyancy forces are much, much more significant than the inertia forces, then this number will be much greater than 1, because this one represents the buoyancy to viscous, and this one represents the inertia to viscous. And so this means the buoy if this is much greater than 1, the buoyancy forces are much greater than those forced inertia forces, and we'll have a natural convection problem. In a forced convection problem, it's the other way around. The forced convection, the U infinity that we impose, is much more significant than those naturally arising density-driven flows, and that will dominate, and we'll find that we have a purely forced convection uh, situation, and it will correlate this way. Mixed convection, of course, occurs when the buoyancy forces and the inertia forces are of the same order of magnitude, or this ratio is about 1. So be aware when you're solving a convection problem that you could be in any one of these three regimes. Chances are, for most of our problems, we'll know that we're in the forced convection regime when we impose a significant uh, velocity over the flow. And when we don't impose any flow, uh, then we are quite likely to be in the natural convection range.